the book isn't going to be structured. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start recording because like you know it's good shit and it's good stuff. So anyway, so yeah, carry on. Yeah. I just had this message come up. It was like recording in process. I was like, who was that? Uh, some American lady. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I was saying that um, when reading the loose, the little that I did read, um, it was quite clear and like you pointed out, there wasn't any rigid structure to the to the uh, individual chapters. So you suggested that in the Deleuze reading group, you could go in to that book at any one point. You could pick out any chapter and you could begin there. And I suppose what my point is, is, is that what you're getting at? Is that what you're going to be trying to get at in, in the dissertation to some extent? Yeah, because you were like saying, like, um, is that what they're trying to do in the chapter? Like, where they're trying to... Because uh, he keeps talking about images, doesn't he? Where the image of the rhizome and the image of the trees... And like, how are you going to see the book? Are you going to see it as a rhizome? Are you going to see it as a tree? And so like traditional philosophical books, they've been organized as kind of like representations of of the world, you know? So like the book is like a a copy of the world in language where you're trying to describe how the world is. But Deleuze and Guattari don't want to do that. They want to plug the book into the world and have the book be like an extension of the world rather than some kind of representation of it. You know, so like, the book, yeah, like the book is a machine that they're trying, that they're like plugging into the world in order to try and do certain things. And like, because they're not trying to represent some kind of fixed metaphysical order that's out there in the world. You sure. know, it, it's like, because they don't think really that there is one. And they're just trying to like invent concepts in order to like render the world in a certain way and, and kind of reveal the world in a certain way. They're not really interested so much in like what's definitively true or false. Do you think that when reading a piece of work that's written in that way, it makes it easier or harder to understand? Like, does the does the systematic approach of uh, Spinoza, let's say, float your boat a little bit better than uh, the sort of rhizomatic approach that they're taking in uh, with with the losing guitar? Well, I mean, like Deleuze uh, is very spinozistic, but I think that he has a def- he has a very different style, you know. Sure. Like, but I think that, like, um, you know, it's like you know how like Spinoza when he came out with all that stuff, it was like a revolution because everyone was like Cartesian before that, sure. and they saw the world in terms of like two different substances. Yeah, dualism. And, yeah, yeah, and it's like, well. Is it that the world was always Spinoza and then Spinoza just came along and described that the way that the world really is and Cartesianism was wrong? Mm. But I don't think Deleuze would say that. I think that we were living in a Cartesian world. It was almost like we're living in a Cartesian world and then Spinoza came out with his stuff and then he revealed the world in a certain more profound uh, way and then... It's almost like the world became Spinoza after that because because there's no real definitive way that the world is. It's but it's more like you're you're revealing the world in a certain way with the power of the concepts that you invent. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I'm not saying that the world literally changed from like there was two substances and then they became one substance, but it's like it's like I know you. yeah, you know what I mean. It's like, yeah, you actually hear commentators saying it when they talk about the history of philosophy and how from this point onwards, you know, it sort of shifted uh, the, the philosophical conversation in a different direction. It's like you get one person come along and it completely shifts the, the it's like a fork in a road. And now it was going that way and now it's going that way. And with that, this is where I find it kind of interesting because from the little that I do know from what you've told me, Deleuze, uh, if I'm not mistaken, sort of takes the, the analogy or the concept of the, the root as being something slightly more rigid in its structure, something more hierarchical in its, its sort of makeup. And then the rhizome uh, is something more fluid and changing. It's a little bit more akin to that, which is, if you were to take one side of the argument, uh, becoming as opposed to, the rigidity possibly of, of being. Um, is that a fair assessment or would you say something different? 
Yeah, I guess so. Well, I think it's like that the root in the tree is like it has a certain fixed structure, but the rhizome doesn't really have a fixed structure. It can just go off in whatever direction that it wants to. But I think like Deleuze in that, he's not really against trees, you know, because I think that he says in the introduction that like the rhizome can like link to trees. And it, so it's not like that he wants to collapse all trees or whatever. And he says that as well in like the body without organs chapter where he says like, you don't want to like destratify too fast and too violently because you can end up with like a black hole body without organs or whatever. Or like you, yeah. you can like, if you collapse things too violently, you can end up with chaos. For instance, like if you took down the government, and didn't put anything up in its place you would just like throw everything into chaos wouldn't you and stuff you've got it he does he's not against like hierarchies and strata like definitively or whatever you know but he yeah which is actually kind of similar to something that i read when i was reading Nietzsche. uh in particular it was on the use and abuse of it was history for life and he talks about three uh different historical practices. There's monumental, uh, antiquarian, and critical. The, the monumental history is all about activity and ambition. Uh, the antiquarian is, is more about preservation and, and ambition. And then the, the monumental, no, sorry, the critical is, is more akin to like abolition and sort of liberation. Uh, but there's there's something to be said, I think, about that last one in particular, the the, the critical uh, form of, of history that's, if you were to take uh, a historical concept and completely abolish it, and that was all that you did, um, without, the, without the, the sort of process that comes along with it, whereby you learn from it and liberate yourself so as to, Sort of propel yourself forward um, and do something different within a society like you're saying that to be completely um like you know how for example with the monuments recently i mean it wasn't too recent how long ago was it like a, a year ago when you heard about people like pulling down monuments and stuff like that mm -hmm. sort of taking a piece out of history and and wanting to erase it entirely um of course there's no problem with doing that so long as there's something to put in its place, like you're saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's something to be said about the way in which Nietzsche, I think, as well, influenced Deleuze. Again, I don't know too much about Deleuze, but I do know that he has a whole piece on, on Nietzsche. What do you mean? You know, when you said those three things, they're yeah. like they're like ways of reading history, you mean? Like, what do you mean? Like? Yeah, because the yes, the essay itself, I want to be careful because it's been a while since I read it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the knowledge might be a little bit rusty. But yeah, there are ultimately different ways of looking at history. There is, like I said, the, the first sort of practice being that which is monumental. Um, I suppose that approach would be to take a look at history and do with it something active. Right, which would actually be more akin to what Nietzsche's philosophy is all about, which is life advancing. Um, you also then have the antiquarian, which is actually something that he critiques in, in a few ways uh, to, to preserve history. Um, if you were to only preserve history and admire it, to look at history purely as being something of the past, and collect knowledge and facts about the way that history once was, but you did nothing with it. You, did, you didn't engage with it critically and you didn't learn lessons from it. So as to, uh, like I say, propel a society in a new direction. No interpretation. Exactly, no interpretation. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I suppose that's kind of, it kind of links to his perspective, it was his perspectivism as well, because that's all about interpretation. Um, you know, whereby you can you can talk about it in your own in your own life as well. I mean, if you were to be completely the antiquarian type and look back at your life and and sit there and admire it and say, "Ah, oh, man, that was you know that was great back then," and you just you just sat there and you you loved it. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't move. Mm -hmm. You know, things wouldn't progress forward 
uh, there needs to be some critical engagement and there needs to be some ambition. There needs to be some activity um, involved. Um, you have to contextualize your life in terms of a, a narrative that's sweeping through it. Like I mean, you, that's a nice way of looking at it. I so mean, like you eliminate certain things from memory and you highlight certain things in your memory in order to like contextualize it in a certain kind of overarching story. Is that what you mean? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure whether that's what Nietzsche would say precisely. Um, I mean, I would agree with that. I know that Nietzsche specifically talks about forgetfulness, but he, he speaks of forgetfulness as being an active uh, force. Uh, we think of forgetfulness as being something that might be derivative of uh, a decaying mind. Like if you have Alzheimer's disease or dementia and like you can't remember the past, he, he doesn't mean it in that sense. He means it as an active process so as to um, free up your your, your so as to sort of free up your mind psychologically so that you have, it's kind of like psychological hygiene. I remember him saying psychological hygiene. Uh, yeah, you kind of clear the leaves away and you make room for things that are more essential, more important. And you can see how that ties into his overall um, sort of philosophy about recreating the self, sort of, uh, speaks of a revaluation of values and I think that that's an important process that we all must go through if we wish to progress and grow and, and develop and advance and that is essentially what Nietzsche is trying to speak about as that's far as how, I can. that's how the brain works isn't it where you, it like prunes things that are unused and like and it like embellishes things that are being used and so yeah. that that matches like neurology doesn't it because you are kind of always pruning away things that aren't needed and stuff and and yeah. uh, exaggerating things which are essential. Yeah, and I think I think it's an important process. I mean, it's kind of like in um in that scene in Limitless, where you have an intelligent individual, but he's got writer's block and he's down and out in life, and then he pops this pill, man, and all of a sudden he's like he glimpses at the corner of a book and he recalls exactly where he, where he saw it and he, he remembers the things that he read. It's like, there's, there's lots of stored potential, but if you want to function, if you want to be able to act, you can't hold on to every bit of information that you've ever received because you would just be, you would be filled up with knowledge and useless facts. And I say useless, of course, if I could recall everything that I've ever read, it wouldn't be very useless. It'd be pretty, pretty, pretty damn cool but uh you know what i'm trying to say the brain can't comprehend like excessive amounts of knowledge all the time mm -hmm. i feel like your ability our ability to do that increases like when you know how like we were saying before about contextualizing yourself in a certain narrative yeah. you know like i think that it, like a lot of things like um like people tell themselves that they aren't good at things and then they kind of like, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy where they aren't good at things because they don't believe that they are. And they say like, oh, I'm terrible at maths. I can't do maths or whatever. And then it's like a self-fulfilling thing. Whereas if you don't really have any ideas about who you are or what you can do, it's a, I mean, it's not like you can do everything, like jump over a building or whatever, but like, yeah, yeah. like the, the possibilities of your life increase because you don't like, Put any limits on yourself that like self-imposed limits that say like oh i couldn't possibly do this or i couldn't possibly you know what i mean like i do know what you mean i mean it's it's something that i i wrote in in the preparation for the uh for this podcast actually and actually borrowed a quote from uh Furback, the essence of christianity uh, where he says if the being concerned is limited its feeling and understanding would be limited too mm. You confine yourself and restrict yourself to this little physical box and you say you know that that's all that i am um and you know throw a bunch of rationality and logic on top of that and you might just dig yourself into a little like confined pit mm. you know there needs to be an element that's instinctual and ambitious and open-minded and free mm -hmm. because you know, I've, I've, I've sort of experienced what it is to be both. I think we can all relate when we think about how we were as children and you kind of look at the world uh, with, with 
more potentiality. You see the potentiality of things mm. without the, the self-restricting beliefs that are kind of imposed on you. And so then people say, well, you know, when you were a child, you looked at the world with uh, rose tinted glasses as if that was a bad thing. Like, I don't know why that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. I think we should look at the world with rose tinted glasses mm -hmm. because it's, it's much more groovy that way. So, uh, well, you went, yeah. Deep, yeah, you went deeper than me there because I was just saying like people telling themselves that they're bad at maths and stuff. But then you said, <laughs> then you said like, oh, limiting yourself to this physical being. But like, you're right, because like, telling yourself that you know when people say oh only human you know and like oh i'm just a human being and stuff it is like a kind of idea that you're self-imposing and like like a kind of restriction that people are i mean i guess it might have its value because it's like a a mooring pin that people are using to kind of orient themselves or whatever like oh i'm a human being in this but if you know if you get rid of that idea you know like i think it's true that like a lot more kind of you know if you don't really know what you are you can't yeah. kind of be anything really in potential, I suppose. Exactly. And I think there's a freedom to that. Um, Nietzsche, again, as I was sort of preparing for this, I, I sort of reminded myself of a few things. And one of them that I sort of remind myself of, because it's such a long time ago when I, I read it, was The Birth of Tragedy. And in it, he's basically talking about uh, Greek tragedy and art. And um, in particular, he wants to talk about two sort of juxtaposing uh, sons of Zeus. You have Apollo on the one hand, who represents beauty and order. That's uh, things like, you know, rational thinking, the logic, um, individuation, so being able to sort of confine yourself to a single identity. And then there's the, the sort of more primal, ecstatic, chaotic uh, Dionysus. Rock and roll. Dionysus. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's, yeah. Uh, which sort of is, is more passionate, more emotive, um, more instinctual. And there's something really cool that Nietzsche draws on there is he sort of talks about the abolishment of that, that sort of individual that we get with, with um, Apollo. And that in that abolishment of the individual comes this like, what does he call it? primal oneness i think it is it's primal oneness like this unity um with who you truly are like you first and foremost the body and that's one point that nietzsche uh, really sort of drills home he believes that there's a great wisdom in the body and that and and i know that you're going to disagree with this but he believes that consciousness is merely an epiphenomenon you know consciousness is something that arises out of the body and is ultimately uh a, a, sort, a sort of weakened self it's it's more in in, in alignment with the ego and um it sort of speaks of the danger of, of believing yourself to be holy that that apollo that uh that orderly rational being and he's saying no 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 like first and foremost you, you you're chaos like you're just born into this world randomly like obviously not randomly it's determined to a certain degree but there's a lot of chaos going on and there's a lot of chaos within you as well. And there's the opportunity there, I think, through self-mastery, he goes on to say, to sort of draw the line right down the middle of the two of them. Of course, we fluctuate between the one side being like chaotic and crazy and the other side being quite orderly and disciplined. Uh, one's more instinctual, I'd say, and the other's more intellectual, you know, one's more you know what i'm trying to say um i think they, you need both don't you and really you can't get rid of one can't really get rid of the other because it's like what we were saying before about Deleuze with like rhizomes and trees where it's like where he said don't destratify too fast don't like completely get rid of all structure because even if you do do that and smash all the structures structures will always reform you know what I mean? Like, because if, if you reduce everything to pure chaos, there's never really pure chaos, you know, it's always actualized in a certain way, you know? So like, yeah. if, if you like, um, like, let's say that you had a army or something and you had a general and he ruled the army for like 20 years and then that general died, there would be chaos, but then naturally like 
other structures would form and like either the army would break apart or a new general would arise and it would always reform itself back into some kind of structure and that's yeah, just, and like so structure and chaos is always in a kind of mutual dance isn't it like so Bacchus and uh and Apollo are always in a mutual dance you know like of, of back and forth or something yeah there's a flux going on and that's kind of a good segue into another key point that Nietzsche always talks about, which is decadence or decay. It could maybe be better thought of as decay. It talks about it of, of, of a culture or a civilization where when a culture, and you have to remember as well, he's writing at the back end of you know, the death of God. Um, when, when you have a culture that's assigned all of their cultural values to, uh, to a Christian God in this instance. And that is sort of uh, abolished, you know, like you say, destratified, sort of torn down, gradually, but torn down. You're left in this state of decadence, he says, whereby you have individuals that don't believe in the value system any, long, any longer, or, or, or rather where they come from. And so what they're forced to do is, like you say, develop new value systems. Mm. So he doesn't believe that decadence is bad per se, because on the back end of, uh, of, of the decay of certain value systems comes the renewal of fresh, brand new ones. And, and that, again, like to go back to what we were saying right at the start, it's kind of what you see happening with, with philosophers when they present a piece of work or a concept, their worldview, their interpretation, somebody comes along and uh, they analyze it or critique it and it forks it in a different direction, like it splits the path. And now you have a completely different interpretation. You said just before we started the conversation that you don't think if we went back 100,000 years that the world would play out exactly how it did. And I agree with that. I think that there's an element of chaos and disorder to the, to the world um, you know, and, and the universe at large. So to, to say that, it would go the same way as, um, I think, reductionist in a little bit. I think it would be unfair to say that. Um, but yeah, I wanted, sorry, go on. I can't hear you actually. No, nope. I don't know if that's my problem. Oh, now I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think that's like the difference between Deleuze and Spinoza, because it seems like Spinoza thinks that um, he thinks that everything's one substance, all there is is God. But he thinks that everything's like organized in such a way that it could be known like objectively. So like the world is like a giant machine that's all intricately linked. Every part's linked to every other. But it's like yeah. if you had some kind of infinite supreme intellect, you could literally know every single piece of it. It's like a massive jigsaw puzzle or a massive machine that every single part could be known and like I think Deleuze agrees that there's only one substance but it's like there's always this element of like unknowability in it yeah. where like there, there are like fields of difference like the brain is like a field of difference that could actualize itself in all kinds of different ways and that there, there isn't it can't be known completely clearly all the way through because there's always this element of like um creative chaos which which yeah. kind of like underlies the structures that appear you know i think maybe that's yeah accurate. yeah i complete i agree with that and i think that it has something either to say about our capacity um, as autonomous beings to uh, exercise our free will and make choices and i don't believe that you know uh if we were to replay everything again from a hundred thousand years ago, everyone would make the exact same choice. Uh, I just don't see that happening. I, I think that's illogical, but um, not only do I sort of see that happening. I also think that because we are first and foremost instinctual creature in, instinctual creatures, there's got to be an element of unpredictability uh, about us. If, if, we were, if we were just intellectual, if we were just rational, um, then maybe you could make somewhat of a claim that, like you say, um, 
things could could go the same way or you could abstract yourself almost like out like outside uh, as an infinite mind looking down and you'd be like oh yeah like let me just pull these strings because everyone just it's like nah because there's an element of chaos chucked into the mix mm. um and i think that that unpredictability is is what makes life exciting you know and what makes again like the the possibilities endless um it's like um you know how people think of the brain uh it's like so like we we talk about the brain like with the metaphor of a computer where it's like you file away memories and stuff and you have like a central process you know like people use that metaphor but really the brain's more like uh um like every single part of it is linked to every other and so you can't really say where a thought emerges from because it kind of bubbles up from this kind of unknowable like depth the brain is just like it's just a series of connections and every single connection is connected to every single other point like this giant kind of net like network and so like the the kind of neural patterns that are bubbling up you can't trace them back to some kind of originating point because they're kind of bubbling up from a kind of um unknowable source that that you know what i mean it's like okay. primordial loop like yeah yeah like yeah. like weather patterns or something where it's like you can't trace them back to some kind of you can't say oh this thing caused this wind to appear and this wind caused this other wind and because it's all just so complex that it's like it just it resolves itself into a kind of you know what I mean? Like the patterns that are you coming up, they're not really coming from somewhere. They're, they're just kind of emerging from. Yeah. And I think as well, just to extend your, what you're saying there about memory, I think whenever we, if, if ever we've experienced a, an obsessive, like compulsive thought, let's say a, a memory that's entrenched in, in our, in our memory, um, a memory that's entrenched in our memory, in okay. our brain. So, yeah, like, uh, then you would actually sort of render that individual unwell, like to, to be constantly retrieving and, and pulling at a, a past memory and reliving it over and over again sort of doesn't give credit to the, the nature of, of memory, which is, is ever flowing, like you say, and, and it, sort of ties in with thoughts it kind of just bubbles up and i mean you ever smell a smell and it reminds you of something from your childhood i mean you that's not an example of a memory that you're you're compulsively sort of picking out that's like a different process um and i think nietzsche would have something to say but i keep on mentioning that guy's name but um i think nietzsche would have something to say about that because he believes that the things that we remember the most are, are typically a result of pain you know, and yeah. um, and that's a that's a form of punishment. I mean, the the public spectacle back in the day. I mean, if somebody had committed treason or broken a law, I mean, you wouldn't chuck them into prison and say, "Well, you're there for life now." Like, you get some meals and you can go work out, and like you get to socialize with your buddies like an hour a day. Like, it'd be cool. It's like now nah, you would get you would get tortured in front of people uh, so as to ingrain in the in the spectators' minds like. Don't do it, because <laughs> if you do, we're going to torture you too. And I think that that's a fair assessment that he makes, is that it is typically the, the memories that are sort of driven by pain that, that tend to crop up in our minds a little bit more, I would say. Um, but when Bergson talks about pure duration, and he talks about sort of... Uh, I, I sort of feel like that's a little bit more akin to what memory actually is experienced like. It's kind of experiences as though it's part of this ongoing stream of time. And uh, mm. I think whenever we attach, like I say, to a thought and we hold on to it, we kind of restrict that that ongoing process. We kind of keep ourselves locked into a to a place in a time or to an instant in our lives that isn't necessarily healthy or good for us. Yeah. Mm. Kind of made a bit of mumbo jumbo about that, but. Uh, no, I think I get what you mean. Oh, yeah. 
I think the reason why we keep mentioning mentioning Nietzsche and Deleuze is because like that's what we're writing our dissertations on. So our heads full of quotes from them and stuff, and like so yeah. it keeps cropping back up. I don't know yeah. much about Bergson, but like it's funny how like uh, now that I get to the end of the degree and stuff, and I've been learning about philosophy for a while, it's like making links between different philosophers. And I think that there is definitely like a, a tradition that comes through like from Nietzsche to De Bergson to Deleuze to Foucault and um, and, not, and like, because you can see how they're following on from each other. Because like in the way that Bergson talks, did you read that one, the life and consciousness one, where it's like that there's like a, a physical matter, but then there's like a current of consciousness, which is sweeping through it, which is kind of like, it's not separate from it or outside of it, but it's like somehow imminent in it. And like that is reminiscent of like what Deleuze says, where it's like, there's this, there's the virtual and the actual. And so it's like, there's, there's something which can't be pinned down in terms of identities, which is imminent in the world itself, which is real, but it's not like, um, it's not any kind of particular thing. And it's like, it's from there that, that the life enters into it because without that element, you would just have like dead matter. So like you would have like, cause like a stone or something, it doesn't have that kind of virtual supplement yeah. Whereas a human being is full of that because it's because like the possibilities are so dramatically uh, more for the human being. Yeah. So that's what it's quite a complicated about. issue to uh, quite a complicated thing to talk about, considering that we didn't uh, really cover Bergson for very long. And I think he's somebody that you probably do have to really delve into because um, yeah. it's quite a complicated idea i mean i i do sort of know what you're talking about because i actually wrote the essay on bergson um so i'll try my best to sort of remember what it was that i was saying in there but from what i could tell when reading bergson is he kind of distinguished fixed brain matter um being uh, part of an evolutionary process and the intellect in particular part of the evolutionary process that helped us to deal with material and spatialized um, things, basically. But how consciousness is that penetrating flow of life that you're talking about there that, that sort of bypasses it and sort of weaves throughout all organic life. That's what the essay was on, on how it extends to all organic life in general. And um, he makes a good, a good point in there how if you, were to, if you were to look at the single celled organism, it would still express to some extent consciousness. It would be diffused, confused, but it would still be expressing a certain degree of consciousness. And we looked even at, in class, so it was, it was in the seminar after the lecture, I think it was, um, I think it was like an amoeba or something. It was some, it was some little cell under a microscope. And, and you can see it, it it's, it's locating other, other cells and it's moving towards it. And then it's like digesting it. And you're like, what the, that's happening inside of people like, and that's going on. And then you see it on the macro scale extended in, in our human interactions. And so I think there's some merit to, to what he's saying there. Um, it's really quite fascinating. He was an watch, interesting dude. Do you watch Green Planet, the David Attenborough one that just came out? <laughs> Where it's like, well, he's, do, he's doing like what he does, but he's doing it all with plants. And so they set up these motion cap, capture cameras where like they're recording a plant over like, you know, days and weeks. And when and then they speed it up. And when they speed it up, the plants are just moving around like animals are, you know, like, like patching things and climbing up trees <laughs> and stuff. And like, really, the, the, there's not really any difference between the plants no. and the animals other than the speed of their movement, you know? Because when you watch them in fast forward, they're just doing everything that animals do, you know, yeah. but just slower. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. I've always found that fascinating how when you look at a, a plant that's been on time lapse, uh, even the way that it buds, it sort of, it, it, it grows and then it dies and then it grows and it dies. And you see that going on constantly in, in organic, like biological life forms, um, mm -hmm. constantly throughout the whole scale of life. Um, yeah, I'll have to watch that. It was that good. sounds that sounds like a good watch. There was this vine where the vine was like it would put out feelers, and then it would like when the vine branch hit the branch, it would like wrap around it, and it would and it would just climb up the tree like a like you know like 
like with these arms made out of vines so that it could get out and like get the sunlight at the top of the uh that... incredible but yeah you know it's like i think it's true that like that consciousness you know because we'll have this idea maybe from descartes or whatever or from god where it's like the soul or life or consciousness is somehow like inside the body you know like when in genesis where it's like God breathes the breath of life into Adam. Adam's like a clay container and God breathes the breath of life into him. And so we have this feeling that life is somehow contained in the body, like a little spark of life. And, you know, like when you hear like Neil deGrasse Tyson or whatever, and they say like, we're going to go out to space to search for intelligent life. Like, but the implication being that like the, that life this is somehow it. locked up inside bodies. You know what I mean? Like, sure, yeah. So we're going to have to identify some kind of other body and then put life inside of it. But that's all just, it's not really, it's all just kind of mythology, really. Yeah. And it's sort of counter to the point that you're making there. That I mean, I mean the fact that a plant can shoot its vine onto a tree and climb up the tree so that it can get light, to me, screams intelligence. I mm -hmm. mean, that's pretty damn intelligent to me. Uh, considering it's supposed to be a non-feeling, non-thinking thing, it's like, well, that's something more instinctual in in a plant. I mean, and you see it. What's interesting as well is that you actually see animals and plants interacting with one another. They 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 cohabit a space. Let's say um, that a an animal might go into what are those big plants called? That they, they kind of look like big bins. They have like a lid that opens. And inside of it at the bottom is like this plant juice. And uh, it kind of entices uh, insects like ants. They come up to it and they, they, they drink it like nectar. And then if a big raindrop comes down and bumps the top of the lid, that little ant will fall into the bottom and the plant will digest it and use it. Like a Venus flytrap, but bigger. Like Kind of, yeah, kind of like that. Like, But what's the word that I'm looking for where they um, they kind of work together um like an ecosystem symbiosis yeah symbiosis exactly yeah like that type of thing um but it all works in a way i remember hearing it from alan watts like um the best thing that we could do for nature is just to leave it alone like it would naturally equilibrate because there's just this like instinctual intelligence to yeah. life in general and, like and the bacteria like, in like in, that are appearing in like um, rubbish heaps that are digesting plastic, like because the that, nature. I didn't know about that actually. Is that a thing? Yeah, I think they found like certain strains of bacteria in rubbish tips that are like eating plastic. You know, oh. so like when they say like I'm not obviously I'm not saying oh we should just throw plastic into the environment or whatever, but you know like when they say oh it'll take ten thousand years for this to decompose. Yeah, if there's already bacteria present that are going to die, that are starting to digest the plastic, you know, maybe it wouldn't be so long as we, maybe it wouldn't take that long. Well, obviously, I'm not saying like we should just. Yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah you're making the claim that, yeah, that life is intelligent. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and that basically when it's infiltrated with something that isn't good for it, it will find a way of getting rid of it. Um, but like it's getting away from this idea that life is somehow inside bodies, isn't it? Like that we feel so yeah. strongly because of the way that our culture has been has been for thousands of years okay you know, like and so it's not that life is somehow locked up inside some kind you know like when we were at school and when you were taught about what life is they could never define it strictly they always gave it by its signs do you remember where it was yeah. like you know something is alive because it it respires it eats it reproduces sure, it it's, so it's always you give it by its signs but you can't give a strict definition because the idea that life is contained within a certain form is ridiculous and it's easy to kind of put life inside the human body because the human body is so complex that you can kind of slip it in there but then but then you have to say like okay so if a human is alive and a fox is alive and a, a cell is alive and then what about a virus and then it starts to get ridiculous because it's like how can a virus be alive when it's so simple because it's because it's so simple that you can't hide the concept of life in the form you know what I mean? So it's like yeah. that concept of life is kind of faulty because it's like we're trying to smuggle it into bodies when really it's it's more that the in reality is alive and all forms kind of participate in that one life yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, I'm with you. And it's, it's, it's kind of like you're saying about this um, 
unitary picture that's that's depicted of the self from thinkers like Descartes, even uh, I would I would say even Plato, but the the Christian religion as well, like that the soul is contained within the body, as you're saying there, and that it was sort of gifted us by God, um, and then through like an intellectual sleight of hand, Descartes adopts it and and says. Uh, yeah, no, the self is actually located in the mind. Like the mind is separate from the body, but like that's where that's where we are. That's the good stuff. That's the nitty gritty, you know. And um, and then with Nietzsche, he comes along and he wants to dispel that unitary picture. He's saying, you know, the self is is a multiplicity. Um, he wants to suggest that the self is actually the body. It's it's the body and all of its biological impulses and drives that are competing for you know with dominating forces. Um, I mean, and, and we can kind of see this. I mean, we, we don't we don't sit there and say, like, I think I might be hungry. It's like, no, you, you're hungry and, and the body tells you and then you say, oh, right, I better do something about that. Um, and, and if you don't do something about that, then that dominating urge for nutrition, for fuel will completely consume who you are. So who you think you are really isn't who you are. Like on the more basic primordial level, primordial level, um, you're just this like little biological thing that works exactly how an animal or a, pr a plant does. You know, a plant shoots its vine and gets sunlight. We know that we need food. Um, and, and so we get food. And, and so in lots of ways, there are a lot of connections there with, with organic life and, um, yeah, I think I think we are saying is is fair. I mean, what are you what are you talking about with regards to? Are you talking about God at any point in that dissertation? Because the topic of conversation today was supposed to be about God with Tara, but I don't know where yeah, Tara is. Uh, <laughs> not, not so much like in the dissertation, I suppose. I mean, I I suppose I'll get to that at the end because at the end I'll start to say about like how um you em we employ the non-dual method or whatever as a set of concepts in order to like kind of rewrite ourself, you know, because it's, because like we conceive of ourselves as an individual yeah. body. So like, even when, like, when we're learning about Spinoza, where, you know, like we would be sitting there with Chris and he would say, all there is is infinite substance. And we are individual modes of infinite substance. There's still this feeling of like, I am somehow yeah. an individual being, you know, like, but really there aren't really a multiplicity of modes because each mode is like the wave on an ocean, isn't it? Where, so like all there is is infinite substance and I, this body is a, is a mode of substance and the building that I'm in is a mode of substance and everything, but really there's not a multiplicity of modes because you can't really separate them one from another because like sure. the body is like a whirlpool. If the, if the, if the reality is a river, the body is like a whirlpool in that river, but you can identify a whirlpool and say, Oh, look, there's a whirlpool, but really it's not really separable from the river. Is it? You know yeah. what I mean? So there's not really a multiplicity of modes, but there's still this kind of feeling that comes through because we've been trained so strongly to feel individual and separate. Even when yeah. we say God equals nature and everything's infinite substance, we still have this remnant feeling of being an individual self. And so we say everything's infinite substance and we are individual modes of infinite. So, you know what I mean? There's still this kind of feeling of individuality. And so non-duality functions as a way of getting rid of that feeling and leaving <coughs> you as God, you could say in the sense of infinite not not yeah, a particular yeah. being but yeah. but actually feeling yourself not just conceiving of yourself as being infinite but actually feeling it to be true you know yeah yeah i mean that's that's exactly what because you read it was what i was trying to get at in in the preparation for the podcast really because like i say in it like um for me god is is uh whatever is is loving and good um of course that's sort of not quite what you're saying here but um i always remember like at church it was it was the the communal sort of togetherness of like-minded people sharing in 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 the same experience that uh that i 
I personally felt God the most, my conception of God, because like through worship or group prayer, um, there was the abolishment of the feeling of being that individual self that you're talking about, you know, because when you're sharing in something um, together, there kind of needs to be this, especially something as like intimate and um, vulnerable as like holding your hands up in, in worship or like having people put their hands on you and pray for you. If you're there stuck in your head, little old like, you know, egotistical cane, like saying, man, I feel awkward. Like these guys are putting their hands on me and praying for me and stuff. Like nothing's going to happen. You know, there needs to be that dissolution of the ego if there's going to be any any sort of progress being made. Um, and there's kind of an elation felt when you do that. When you let go of the, the confines and, and the restrictions of being like Cain, like the, the ego Cain, like you feel that freeness. It's it's like, oh man, it's a, it's a weight off your shoulders. It's liberating because for a second there you get like a moment of peace and you think, I got to have that. Like, that's good. And uh, that's why I enjoy church so much because you just have people there with, with spreading good vibes. <laughs> And, and they just wanted what was good for you as well. And um, you could be yourself, truly, as opposed to like worrying about how you look and how you come across. Um, and there's something to be said about that experience as well with when it comes to music and stuff like that. Again, it's kind of Dionysian. Um, there's that abolishment of the individual self, which um, is something that I, I always, like I say, sort of found a sense of peace in. Um, I actually have a quote there from Psalm 105, 18, that says, um, he brought them out of the utter darkness and tore off their shackles. And I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that because the, I, I sort of interpret that and I'm reading here from, from the bit that I sort of prepared is that the shackles are the, the self-limiting beliefs, the traumas, the distrust, the emotional turmoil. They represent the, the darkness that's inherent in, in human experience. And, um, I think that any time that we try and deny ourselves of what we feel, what we what we remember and stuff like this, we only sort of extend that darkness further. There needs to be a confrontation of, uh, with these things. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be uh, the eventual acceptance of these things. I think only then that you can truly heal yourself. Um, and like I say, that, that communal togetherness in the church kind of gave you the the expressive medium to do that. Um, and I always got it through through music as well. Like I used to write songs a lot growing up and, and playing the guitar and it, and it gave me that capacity to sort of get what was stuck inside out. And that's something I think that's, it's a creative act and it's, and it's also an active force. It's an active force because if you were to contain negative emotion, and harbor that that feeling of, of, of that bad feeling that maybe you have towards somebody. Eventually, it would develop into some sort of resentment, um, and resentment is poisonous, you know, because then you start harboring fans, you know, fanciful uh, ideas about what you might do to that person or what you might say, and you're not actually doing anything. You, you you're just sitting there kind of passively and, and there's nothing that's uh, life affirming or, or strengthening about living in that way. You become so, anti-life, you become like resentful yeah. of life and you become like an agent of resentment that yeah. poisons everything around you. Yeah, and I suppose that's kind of what I was trying to get at earlier when I was talking about memory and how when you're played with that memory that, that might keep pro, uh, like popping up and you, you try and like repress it, or, you know, depress it, you push it down you say like, nah, 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 like, and you, you act like that doesn't exist. You actually do yourself a disservice in the end because all, all that you end up doing is casting a shadow. Um, mm. and, and that's what I was saying in, in the preparatory notes is that that shadow is sort of like a, a blind spot like a personal blind spot when you're driving a car and you can't see out of a certain point i mean you're more inclined to crash you know because um it does that you know you need to confront these things if you're to heal from them 
them and to move forward yeah. as, as a more forthright and active individual. Mm-hmm. Like trauma. You still you there? Know, yeah, I think it's gone, all, gone a bit fuzzy. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Hey. Must be the connection. Just, yeah, I just had a notification. Your internet connection is unstable. Mm. I was gonna say something. But oh yeah, like trauma. If you sure. repress it, it always returns like indirectly and influences your life from the shadows, you know. Yeah. It yeah. reminded me of what you were saying before about like how um, you got the feeling of not being an individual self when you went to church. Mm -hmm. You didn't have like the concept of not being an individual self or whatever, but it was like the feeling of it that was coming up. And it reminds us because like in uh, Hindu philosophy, there's like multiple paths towards liberation. And there's one like Advaita Vedanta, which is the path of knowledge where you get to complete liberation from being an individual self by thinking about it and kind of reasoning your way there. And there's also the path, I think it's called bhakti, where it's the path of love, where it's like you get rid of the individual self by kind of like giving in, to, you know, like what you are doing in the church where it's like, you're not really thinking like, oh, I'm not an individual self or whatever, yeah. but you're getting swept away by the experience and kind of losing yourself in the experience of love, which is pretty yeah. much the same thing, but it's like not intellectual. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, I think I think what's cool about that as well is that you can kind of share it. You can share in it. And when you share in it, it only multiplies. Um, and you got a bunch of people who are just being... You're breaking up. Oh, damn. You can say that again, what you said. I think we must have got scrambled. Four bars. I don't know what's going on. It was about um, 15 seconds, 10 seconds. Just say the bit uh, that you said. Um, I said I said that it that feeling that we're talking about is, is great because it can be shared. And when it's shared, it's only multiplied. And um, then you're all partaking in the same thing, the same flow of life, you know. Whereas if you're in a clinical setting or a professional setting, you set a feeling of being an individual self amongst other individuals. There, there, um, there's a rigidity to it all there. And, and there's a, a, a closed offness where I'm presenting an appearance of who I am. But you don't, you don't have that in that experience that, that we're talking about there. Even if you go to a concert and you, and you close your eyes and let yourself get completely immersed and swept up by the music and it's like washing over you. It's like for those four minutes, you're not you. You're just experiencing it. <laughs> I don't even know. There's no, uh, it's hard to explain. The way the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, yeah, to put it quite simply, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because like there's no personal enlightenment because the enlightenment is getting rid of that sense of being an individual person, isn't it? So it's not you're not achieving something like a personal attainment. So enlightenment for one is enlightenment for all, really. You know, because it's because the whole point is that you don't feel yourself to be an individual being. You know what I mean? So it's not that the the sage or the guru attains enlightenment because enlightenment is just seeing that there is no one there no individual there who could attain anything or do anything, you know, because yeah. all there is is the, the ocean, you know, there's no little one in the ocean on a, yeah. little, on a little dinghy or whatever. Yeah. It's just the ocean, you know, there's no, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, we spoke the other day about this, didn't we, about the, the sort of weightlessness, that feeling of peace and serenity that, that you have when you surrender to the current of the, the sort of bobbing of the ocean as you just float around in it, you know, 
you're free from thought in, in that in that instance and you're free from body even you don't feel a sense of body per se i mean you you just are bobbing along in the ocean you are one with the ocean i mean and that's um i think that speaks volumes again to the sort of connectivity that that there is to be had with with nature as we know it um but also i'd like to bring up a quote as well that i have here from the essence of christianity again which um says the understanding of a being is its horizon. The horizon of your being is limited by what you can see, just as what you can see is limited by the horizon of your being. And I think that that speaks. Do that one again, do it again. The understanding of a being is its horizon. The horizon of your being is limited by what you can see, just as what you can see is limited by the horizon of your being. Mm. So what I sort of gleaned from that was that, again, going back to the point that we were talking about previously, if you, if you only view yourself as being capable of doing X, Y, or Z, and you only see yourself as being, you know, a certain type of person, then that's what you'll see. That's your horizon, you know, but it doesn't have to be, you know, and it's the same, like if you're, if you're, if you're filled with anger, I mean, there's that common phrase blinded by anger. It's the exact same thing. I mean, you're literally blinded by anger. It's like um, it's like a guide that just closes you in, and now your tunnel vision, mm -hmm. like, oh man, that's all I can see. And so, like, if we if we only extend our horizons, is my point. Uh, yeah, yeah, that loops us back to what we're saying right at the start, didn't it? About uh, not about the the way that you conceive yourself, limiting yourself. It's all going full circle, baby. It's gone full circle. Yeah, yeah. It's like the the Ouroboros, like this the snakey in its own head. It's, it's... Yeah. We're like George Lucas, you know. It, we're not repeating, we're rhyming and stuff, you know. <laughs> I'm not enough of a Star Wars fan to uh, to comment. But... <laughs> it's like you did an interview where he's like writing uh like he, he finishes Revenge of the Sith or whatever, and he's like discussing it with the other scriptwriters, and he's like, oh, it's, it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes with the past chapters and stuff, and they're all like, oh, yeah, George Lucas. Yeah, yeah. It's, kind of, it's kind of like when I watch these little video analyses, analysis, whatever the word is. Analysis? Of, uh, Anal yeah, Anal yeah. Analysis? I don't know. It's quite the conundrum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, of um, a good... Uh, one of one of my favorite artists, Matt Miller, um, he tends to start um, the album on on a note that is uh, I don't know. Let's say like I, I'm not even going to go into the theory because I don't know the theory. He'll finish the album on an unresolved note, and if you allow the album to replay itself, that unresolved note that it ends on resolves itself at the start. Mm. of the album mm, nice. and so and what's even cooler is that the album's entitled circles mm. so like mm. my dude yeah he, he's he's got it in the bag he he understands that everything is cyclical and it's kind of like um Nietzsche's like except, yeah and Nietzsche's eternal return of the same mm -hmm. kind of being this um this love of fate like this acceptance that I mean things they they their birth and die i mean we can even think that to a relationship like relationship uh, these things they flourish they're nurtured and sometimes they wither and die and and then you know the same thing happens mm. of course if you hold on to that again like we're saying you hold on to that that memory that's sort of like formed you i mean there's no progress to be had there's no re there's no renewal there's no restructuring of Uh, there needs to be that that acceptance if if you to move forward and mm. and let it flow. The eternal return. Mm -hmm. The eternal Indeed. return. That's what Deleuze said. He says that it's not that the same that returns. It's the eternal return of difference itself. Mm. I like that. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> difference and repetition is good. Well, it's like it's maddening though. It's like it drives you insane. What, when reading Deleuze? Yeah, a little bit. You know. I bet. Yeah, like I said to you, I read. I tried reading the introduction. It was it was quite intense, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Struggled to read his style of writing a little bit. Um, but 
maybe maybe once you've distilled it and put it into the dissertation i'll be able to understand it a little bit better i still need to get round as well sorry go on i was just gonna say i felt like that you know like um did i send you the link to that todd may lecture the series of lectures that he gave that's exactly what i was about to say yeah there's like a five-part series i feel like that before i watched that series i didn't understand but i didn't have a clue what Deleuze was going on about but he really puts it in good you know he really kind of uh describes it in a good way and gives you the key to, un to understand it yeah I mean, it's like all things, isn't it, really? So long as you can give it your time and attention and you can sort of grapple with the ideas and, and then sit with it and then revisit it and you have the time to do so, then, then great. But obviously, we know that now that it's crunch time, we've got to do dissertation and you kind of need to get a little bit more selective with what it is that you're you know, spending your time doing. Um, It'll be a breath yeah, of fresh air. A breath of fresh air? I was just going to say it'll be a breath of fresh air when we finish because I won't have to like be so specialized in my reading and stuff. I'll be able to read like novels again, you know, instead yeah. of your philosophy. That's actually a good point, actually. You bring up novels. Is that kind of what Deleuze is getting at when he's, when he, with his style of writing? Um, because I remember, I think it was Sartre who basically said that philosophy should be, there should be the encouragement of philosophy being integrated into things like um, plays and uh, poetry and uh, literature and things like this. And I mean, when you read, if you've ever read Dostoevsky, I mean, he's grappling with the same ideas pretty much that Nietzsche is grappling with, but he's doing it in a completely different format. It's, it's in this like dense um, system uh, in, in, in his novels where you've got character development and through, through the characters, you, you kind of gleam at the philosophy behind it even through the speech, you know, he's sort of developing speech and you get a taste of where their mentality is. Um, would you say that with Deleuze, he, he writes it a little bit more in a novelistic style or? I mean, he never writes novels or plays or stories, but he does like talk about, he, he's a big fan of this guy called Artonin Artaud. Artonin Artaud, I think he's called, who's a playwright. Okay. And he also writes a book about Lewis Carroll and uh, Alice, in the Won Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, but I don't cool. think he ever himself writes stories or anything like that. But there is a sense of like, he, he is a, he does appreciate art and stuff as, as uh, and its ability to kind of, um, I mean, he analyzes like Francis Bacon, you know, the, uh, the painter, and he writes a book about him and um, explains his stuff in a philosophical manner. That's what you did for the aesthetics essay, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did about in relation to Francis Bacon. Mm -hmm. um, cool stuff, to be fair. Mm. Yeah, like Francis that. Bacon. Yeah, it's pretty well, cool. Well, just what you were talking about, actually. It was it was quite cool. I mean, it was quite complicated, I have to admit. But I was, um, it's an interesting topic of conversation, the body without organs. Could you go into the body without organs? Uh, just Ooh. a little bit or is it quite I haven't done the uh I haven't read through it again for I need to do it for Wednesday oh, yeah. uh yeah, it's yeah. like um actually no I better not I'll, I'll save it for yeah. Wednesday I'll do we'll do another I, yeah. I know that yeah. feeling man <laughs> I know that feeling when somebody asks you a question you're like I'm gonna butcher this so <laughs> I'm gonna just leave it alone we'll do another podcast after Wednesday once I've researched it a bit and then I'll be more on the ball with it yeah cool Cool. I mean, there was supposed to be the Deleuze reading group, which I'm looking forward to. If, yeah, if it's four o'clock on Wednesday at um, GM333. Four o'clock. Four o'clock there for anyone watching. Yeah, it'd be sweet, you know. Be sweet. Yeah, be definitely. sweet. Yeah. I'll have like yeah, a document with all the important quotes and stuff, and we can read them and talk about them and stuff. The masochist, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. I can, I can sort of see that. If I might, I'm obviously like I say, I, I don't, I haven't read it myself, but I can see how somebody undergoing sort of, sort of like a sadomasochistic practice is sort of in some way doing what it was that we were talking about mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to that sort of dissolution of the self uh, mm -hmm. being attached and, and sort of confined only to the body. I mean, yeah. Because like Freud says that like the masochist who he wants pain because it's like he, he, he's allowing himself to feel pleasure by yeah. getting the pain. But Deleuze says that's completely wrong and that what the masochist is doing is like he's 
engaging himself in a certain program, like what you're saying about dissolving the self. And he's yeah. like changing himself into something, something else through it, through this program that he's applying, you know, but uh, we'll get into that on Wednesday and the juicy details. I was going to say, that's actually kind of a good segue for something. Uh, one last thing that I maybe wanted to talk to you about here. Um, you talked about then sort of like, I want to talk about the transformative process. Again, something that I wrote on, on my notes in, in preparation for this, um, where I sort of spoke about the ways of, of finding and, and channeling um, anger, as the example of anger. Um, and that's where Nietzsche would speak of creative, the creative art form and active forces. Um, because when reading Deleuze's um, interpretation of, of Nietzsche and Nietzsche in philosophy he says, um, to appropriate means to impose forms, to create forms by exploiting circumstances. And then later on in, in the passage says the power of transformation, the Dionysian power is the primary definition of activity. And, and I like that because it's life affirming again to go to go back to what we were saying earlier. It's you know strengthening, it's constructive. Mm -hmm. um, you use your will to impose forms to create something new, to transform yourself. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas like we were saying earlier, if you shy away um, in darkness, so to speak, and, and you formulate fantasies of revenge, then you'll only make yourself sick because you, you haven't channeled the reactive force um, into something active and transformative, something healing and, and cathartic. And I think that that's what, what God always was for me. That's what that experience was for me, it was catharsis. Um, it was like a healing process. Uh, I was blind, but now I see, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that like, like atheists, like naive atheists, kind of miss that, you know, when they say like, "Oh God, he's not real" or whatever. That, but that's not really the point, is it? You know, like they're kind of missing the point. That's what I like about Furback's reading, actually, of of Christianity. Um, he takes it for what for, for what it is at face value and sort of says, you know, maybe it actually has some symbolic inherent meaning. Again, you were talking about conceptions and, and how concepts are, are, can be told in narrative form to sort of give uh, a meaning or, or an underlying sort of lesson to be learned. And I think that that's what the Bible does when you read it uh, with an open mind. Uh, it's just packed with like lessons that are good. But yeah. Yeah. This was quite juicy, man. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Do you want to come back on? Yeah, definitely come time. back on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe earlier in the, maybe slightly earlier in the day, we've got a little bit more mental energy. Mm, yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, and the more people we can get on, the merrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be sweet. All right, I'm going to stop recording.